The Sacrifice of Alcestis, Chapter 9 Chapter 9. Whilst the preparations for the funeral were being made, anyone who chanced to look along the high road would have seen a stranger making his way towards the palace. He was a strong man and tall. Three cubits and more in height. The muscles of his arms and chest stood out like thongs of cord. In his hand he carried a huge knotted club, and over his shoulders hung a lion's skin. If the wind or the sun were too strong, he would draw the jaws of the beast over his head like a hood, and the great teeth shone out white and terrible over his brows and under his chin. He walked along with great swinging strides, balancing the club upon his shoulder as though it were some light twig, and not heavy as a sapling oak. As he went through the villages the people stood aside from his path in wonder, and even the strongest champion of them all would whisper, May the gods deliver me from ever having to stand up against him in single combat. In his little finger is the strength of my right arm. But he walked on, little heeding what folk thought of him, singing now and again snatches of some drinking song, and passing the time of day, or cracking some joke with those he met upon the way. For, in truth, he had a merry heart, and wished well to all mankind. Those who were frightened when first they saw his club and lion's skin forgot their fears as soon as they could see his face, for his eyes were blue and laughing as the summer sky, and his smile was bright as the sun in spring. And yet there were lines and scars about his features which proved that he was no idler, but one who had looked labor and danger in the face. So he came to Fari and went up the steep path to the palace. It chanced that Admetus was standing in the portico on his way in. When the stranger saw him he shouted out, Hail to thee, Admetus. Turn back and greet an old friend. When Admetus heard him, he turned and came towards him. Welcome, Heracles, he said, and held out his hand to greet him. But when Heracles saw his black robes and shorn locks he was troubled. I have come at an evil hour, Admetus, he said. Thou art mourning for one who is dear to thee. Eh, he answered, it is true. One of thy children, can it be, or thy father? Nay, there is naught amiss with them. It is a woman I am carrying out to burial this day. Is she a stranger, or one of the family? She is not one of the family. Yet she is very dear to us, for on her father's death she came and lived with us. She was a fair and noble woman, and all the house is plunged in grief at her death. Then I will leave thee and go elsewhere. A house of mourning is no place for guests. Nay, cried Admetus, I beg of thee, do not go. Never yet have my halls turned away a traveller from the gates. The dead are dead. What more could we do for them? Twould do them small good to lack in friendship for the living. Come in, come in, I pray thee. In spite of all his entreaties, he forced him to come in, and bade his steward take him to a guest room apart, where he might eat and drink, and hear nothing of the sounds of mourning when the body was carried out to the tomb. And he did all in his power to hide from his guest that it was Alcestis who was dead, for he was ashamed for Heracles to know that he had allowed his wife to die for him. Meanwhile all had been prepared for the funeral, and a train of citizens stood waiting in the court to follow behind the bier. Their long black robes fell trailing in the dust. Their heads were shorn in grief, and with slow steps they followed behind the bier, whilst the mourners sang a dirge for the dead. O daughter of Peleus, farewell, farewell forevermore. Mayest thou have peace in the world below and such joy as may be in those sunless places. O thou black-haired god of death, never has one more noble come down to dwell in thy halls, never, O Charon, thou grim ferryman of souls. Never hast thou carried a burden more precious across the dark and dreadful stream. Oft shall thy praises be sung, lady, by minstrels of music in every land. On the seven-stringed mountain lute shall they sing thee, and in hymns, without lyre or lute, in Sparta, when the circling seasons bring round the summer feast time, and all night long the moon rides high in heaven. In bright and shining Athens shall they praise thee, too, for thou alone, O brightest and best, hast dared to die for thy Lord, and give up thy young life for him. O dark necessity, who shroudest all men about with death, how heavy is thy hand upon this house! From thee none can flee, and Zeus himself bows down before thee. Thou alone, O goddess, hast no temple, no images to which men turn in prayer, neither hearest thou the voice of victims slain. Alcestis is gone gone forever. Our eyes shall see her no more. Light may the earth lie above thee, lady. Dear wast thou when thou wast among us. Dear shalt thou be, too, in death. No mere mound of the dead shall thy tomb be, but honoured of every passer-by, as some shrine of the immortals. 
The stranger toiling up the winding way shall bow his head before it and say, Here leath one who died for her lord. Now she is a blessed spirit. O lady, have mercy upon me. So great shall be thy glory among men forever. Fare thee well, fare thee well, most beautiful. So they laid her in the polished tomb, and placed rich gifts about her, and sacrifices of blood to the grim god of death. When all the rites were accomplished, they went away sorrowful. <laughs>